Thanks so much for being here. My name is Susanna Armenta. I'm curator of exhibitions. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And this is a real pleasure. This is like actually our hallmark event. Um, it's part of the Mapping Imagination exhibit, which if you haven't checked it out or you'd like to check it out again, because there's really amazing materials from our maps collection and from our children's literature research collection. It's up on the third floor, Monday through Friday, nine to five, and the curators are themselves the curators of those two collections, and it's a fantastic exhibit. Um, and this discussion is going to be filmed. It's really a, a, an honor and pleasure to have these two folks here to share their knowledge with all of you. So um, if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, most of the time the camera's gonna be facing this way, but if you're not comfortable with that, please go check out another event. <laughs> um, and my colleague, Andrea, who actually has to give a lot of credit to for bringing this event about is gonna share a couple of remarks at the end, but I'm really grateful to her for um, bringing everyone together and encouraging you all to be here. Um, and it's just a really wonderful chance at another collaboration here at the Free Library. So without further ado, Alex, take it away and you all can introduce yourselves. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Susanna. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really thrilled to see such a big audience. And I'm sure you're all thrilled to be here to see Chip. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Susanna as well as Andrea Lemoyne and uh, for, for organizing the exhibit, but as well Megan McCall, who put together helped put together the exhibit that you can go check out. Um, I worked with Megan to visit the the map collection itself here before this event, and you'll see at least one uh, map from the the archives, which you can go visit yourself anytime. Um, so I should introduce myself, and then I'll, I'll do a, a kind of formal introduction for Chip. Uh, we'll, we'll talk for about 45 minutes. We have a slideshow with images for you to look at uh, from both illustrations and maps from fantasy books. Uh, and then we will open it up for questions, so, so start thinking about questions you'd like to ask. Um, so I'm Alex Romer-Colin. I'm a writer, a teacher, and a translator. Um, I actually work at Temple University Libraries, and I do a variety of work with science fiction, including a, a project to digitize science fiction at Temple. Happy to point you to, to more information about that, but you can find information on the web about it. Um, I've also, since I moved to Philly about six years ago, had the pleasure of getting to know Chip. Um, over that time, I've published two interviews with him that you can go check out on the LA Review of Books. Um, the first interview was about Stonewall and 1968, as well as the legacy of that on, on ships thinking and writing. And then the second, inter the second interview uh, I highly recommend is an interview about Chip's contemporary use of Facebook as an autobiographical platform. Um, <laughs> and, you know, is, is a fascinating subject. Chip uses Facebook in a way very few people do, I think. Uh, and so, anyway, highly recommend that uh, interview as well. Um, we actually did both of those interviews before the pandemic, and the Facebook one came out shortly before the pandemic. Since then, Chip and I have you know, both stayed in touch remotely and then more recently been meeting up in person again. Um, this is actually the first interview we're doing live in front of an audience. All the other interviews I've done have you know, been over a long period of time exploring various subject matter. Um, I don't know if this is one of the first events you've done since the pandemic in person. Um, um, I, one of them. One of them. <laughs> so it's, it's I've done a fair number of Zoom yes. uh, things, both through the pandemic and uh, uh, and since. Right. But it's so it's an honor to be here in person with all of you, and I, I hope you get a chance to chat with Chip. Um, as a formal introduction for Samuel Delaney, in case you are not familiar with his work, uh, Chip was born in, in 1942, uh, and he's an American writer and literary critic. Uh, his work includes fiction, especially science fiction, but it also spans many other genres, including memoir, criticism, essays on science fiction, literature, sexuality, and society, uh, some great works of autobiography as well. His fiction includes Babel 17, The Einstein Intersection, which was winners of the Nebula uh, Award for, in, for 1966 and 67, respectively, Nova, my favorite, Dahlgren. Hell yeah. <laughs> the, return, the Return to Navarian series, which we'll be talking a lot about today. Um, he's, he's also written some amazing works of nonfiction. I highly recommend Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, 
Um, but he's also published many other cl collections of essays and interviews. Uh, Delaney was inducted in as far back as 2002 uh, into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Um, he also, from 1975 to 2015, taught as a professor of English and comparative literature and creative writing at SUNY Buffalo, SUNY Albany, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and then Temple University. Um, the Science Fiction Writers of, of America named him its 30th SFWA Grand Master in 2013, and in 2016 he was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame. Um, Chip continues to write on a, on a regular basis and publish. Um, but like I was saying, over the years, uh, I, it's been a kind of surreal experience for me to get to know somebody who I never imagined meeting in the first place when I read his work <laughs> growing up, uh, and to find that he is one of the kindest, most open-hearted, uh, non-judgmental people you could ever meet. Um, so it's always a pleasure to be around him and to hang out with him, and, and I'm looking forward to you all getting to, to meet him a bit today. Um, I think it's an, a fitting time for this event. Uh, it is Pride Month, and the library is putting on this amazing exhibit uh, about mapping alternate futures and alternate pasts and, and fantasy worlds of all kinds. Um, as I said, we'll be showing some of those uh, maps today. Um, to some extent, the, the subject of today's conversation will be uh, visual culture around fantasy novels. Chip is a big fan of cover art, so we'll be showing you some cover art as well as maps that have influenced his thinking um, around fantasy worlds. So as a way to get started, I thought it would be appropriate since we're in a library to ask Chip a bit about uh, his own experiences with libraries and to hear from you how you feel about public and personal collections in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, my first job when I was 15 years old was in a library. I was a library page uh, in New York uh, and as um, the uh, uh, and I was uh, a it was the St. Agnes branch of the New York Public Library, which ended up quite by accident after I had lived in the East Village and 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 on a lot of couches <laughs> of friends of mine here and there, I ended up living directly across from the St. Agnes branch. And the St. Agnes branch, one of the things I found there, uh, which was a very a uh, big influence of mine uh, on me, uh, I found the score for um, uh, for W.H. Auden's The Rake's Progress. It was the score and the libretto all printed together in one book. And so I, I, while I was there and um, uh, messing around in the basement, I found this and I read the whole thing and I, 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 I developed quite a, uh, the, the libretto had been written both by Chester Kalman, uh, both by W.H. Auden and by Chester Kalman. Uh, so I, uh, you know, that was a, 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 an introduction to their what would you say, to the fact that they were possibly, possibly knew each other. Little did I know that they lived with one another. Uh, although, uh, actually by the time I actually got married, uh, w w at, the, at the ripe old age of 19, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I did know that uh, they were probably, in the, I found out they were in the neighborhood. And at the time, I was married to a, 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 a very brilliant poet named Marilyn Hacker. Uh, and uh, so uh, I got um, a friend of mine who um, knew the, 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 the Audens, a guy named Johnny Cronenberger, whose father, Louis Cronenberger, uh, was a librarian at Harvard and all sorts of things like that. But, um, Auden used to come to their Christmas parties, Auden and Kalman used to come to their Christmas parties. At that point, I put two and two together. If they were coming together to the Christmas parties, there was probably something more between them than just, uh, you know, than, than, than just friends who lived, you know, in the same. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, Johnny, I remember talking about Chester Kalman's imitations of Diana Trilly. <laughs> at the at the uh, uh, at their Christmas party, so anyway, uh, I um, I discovered that, uh, we were living at uh, 629 East Fifth Street, and they were living at seventy four St Mark's Place, uh, which was about a, a fifteen not even a ten minute walk. 
Uh, so they were practically my next door neighbors. Uh, and so I went over there one day and, and I brought some of Marilyn's poems uh, and left them with uh, Chester. Uh, and then a, a little while later, uh, we, uh, we, we, a little while later, what, what happened is they, uh, uh, Meryl, I, we, we, we invited them for dinner and they accepted. Uh, so on February 8th, 1962, uh, um, the door, there was a knock on the door and who should it be? But you know, we, we were expecting them. But uh, Chester Kalman and W.H. Auden. And I think they were impressed by the fact that by this time I had figured out that they were a couple. Uh, and with the fact that we had invited both of them, uh, I think got us points. And so they came over and we had a very nice dinner. Uh, and, uh, and, and from then on in, I, I became fairly uh, well acquainted with Auden's poetry. And, uh, and he was probably certainly one of the, uh, I don't think of him as an influence at all. But I do think of him as one of my favorite, probably my favorite major American poet of that particular time. And it was in the fact that I got a chance to shake his hand and, and actually serve him dinner. And he was so nice to come. Uh, he and Chester were so nice to come. Had a big, that had a big deal to do, do with that. And then some, some years later, when, I was in, when Marilyn and I were in England in 1974 or 5, I believe, he died. Uh, and I, re I remember that uh, very well. And we were just about to have our, our, do our daughter, uh, who was, uh, lives here, not here in Philadelphia, but lives uh, just outside of Philadelphia in uh, Wynwood. And was your mother also a librarian? Oh, yes, my mother was a library clerk. Uh, she was not a librarian. She was a library clerk. She was a senior clerk. Uh, but she, uh, and that's the reason I got the library job at St. Agnes um, in the first place, because she helped, she talked to someone and I ended up. So libraries have always meant a lot to me. I've always liked libraries. And li uh, she also worked, when I look at this, uh, I'm reminded she also was a librarian at the Donnell Public Library, which had, for many years was right across the street from the Museum of Modern Art, which meant I spent a lot of time at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, coming, dropping down to see mom. Uh, and uh, so, you know, and thus, thus, thus it went. So yeah, li that's my, that's about one, Tenth, or maybe one twentieth, uh, of my library at the when I lived in New York uh, at um, uh, 184 West 82nd Street, which is where I lived up until the time I moved out south to uh, <laughs> uh, south to Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, and Chip continues to have an enormous collection of books at home as well and as nothing like <laughs> nothing I had a I, I had an eight room uh, apartment and there was one hall floor to ceiling from one end to the other that was had library books and every room had had shelves like this um, it was a library uh, it had there were about as far, I once figured out there were about 3500 books in my personal library now it's more like 300 uh, and so that losing all that has been was quite a was quite a um, that's one I, I actually cried over a few times, uh, having a very soft heart <laughs> when it comes to libraries. <laughs> and so a large number of your books and personal papers are now at the Yale Beinecke collection? Many of them, are, yeah. There's now a special, there's a Samuel R. Delaney collection at the Beinecke. Uh, and, uh, and also my, my, my Marilyn's uh, archive is at the Beinecke, and for many years my own archive was at um, the uh, Howard Gottlieb Library in, in, in Boston. And then they finally, they, 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 uh, they gave it to the Beinecke. I had to sell it because of life was such that it had to be sold. And uh, so, and I got a, a bit of money, so that was, that was a nice, a nice thing, uh, and that's <laughs> kind of what I'm living off of now. <laughs> so, but uh, there we go. Yeah, and so today we were going to talk about fantasy and mapping, um, and I thought it might be nice to start by hearing you reflect a bit on 
you know, the fact that Chip was primarily famous as a science fiction writer, right? And to you, science fiction and fantasy are deeply interconnected. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Well, my, my very first book was a science fantasy book called The Jewels of Aptor, which I sold when I was about, well, I, was, I sold it when I was 19, and it, and it appeared just when I was, when I was, when I was 20. Uh, and uh, then I did a trilogy of novels that got their names changed. And, uh, uh, and, and then finally, many years later, uh, in, I, I started this, uh, um, what would you, you would call it, a story, a, story, a fantasy series, uh, Return to Navarian. Uh, and that started in about 78 or 79 and went all the way up to 87. By which I, I, at which point I finished it. Uh, um, some. I wonder if you can remark a bit about the cover art. You okay. Oh well, the art. This is all what they call stock art, uh, which is to say, it has nothing to do with the what was going on in the uh, in the in the stories, uh, and they just put whatever art they you know. The, you know, the yeah. Bridge. So you know, there's a you know, there's, there's a boat with, with funny shapes on it, you know, and there are trees with funny you know with funny sh shapes in the leaves, and uh, uh, and the, other than that, this is they're actually fairly nice looking covers, but they don't they don't reflect the story, um, and um, uh, before um, eventually I. I I, these, this, this, uh, some of you may have seen these covers, which is ones that I designed myself <laughs> with uh, a, a man who was living in uh, the same apartment. Uh, and we had a, we uh, rented a room out to John Del Gazo, and he did those. Uh, and and, and the, the, those from, what did I said, 77 to 87. Of the, basically, maybe 76 to 87, maybe 11 years that was spent on the entire series. And so these are the British editions. These right? are British these are British editions and they and and as is often the case in American science fiction and fantasy, especially at that time, uh, and uh, they just the covers have nothing to do with what's inside. Uh, do you want to say a little bit about what Navarian is about? As a series, well, Navarian and Navarian started out as a series of five short stories, novelettes, novel, no, no, novelettes called Tales of Navarian, which was the first one, um, and uh, this was the first cover for Tales of Navarian. Um, I hated that cover. Uh, I hated it specifically because of the Orientalism. In the cover, it's not an Oriental story. It doesn't take place in Arabia. It doesn't, you know. In fact, it's it's it it uh, uh, and um, um, Edward Said had just been writing about the way uh, this kind of stuff is. He he said this is this is a kind of Western pornography, is what you know is what you know. And uh, so I said, and and not only that, um, two of the reviewers actually said uh, when they were reviewing this, boy, is this cover not related to what's inside. And one of them said it citing Saeed, and another one just said there's just nothing about it. Uh, it's by a guy named Glansman, I think. Um, um, Thomas Glansman, I'm not sure of the name. I may be, have it wrong. Uh, but so I said, look, uh, my agent said, uh, I, I said, could we get cover control? And he said, yeah, well, that, we'll ask for it. And so I wrote them a letter. And I said, the only way I will ever use this cover control is if you do one thing. And that is, if the next volume, you use Thomas Glansman again in the same visual approach. That is the what time I will invite. Otherwise, you can do what you want. And the next one came up. Uh, no, this is this is this was this was the solution over here. But the next one, they sent me the, the cover. I don't know whether I uh, it. And there it was. It was another Thomas Glansman cover, you know. Uh, and I, you know, and I and I said, 
I'm going to use cover control. And I'm saying you cannot. Cover control did not mean you could suggest something positive. You could veto the cover. And I said, I wrote you a letter a year and a half ago. I said, I will use it only under one condition. And you've gone and done the one thing that I said, you know. Uh, so I said, you know, I am vetoing the second Thomas Glansman cover. Uh, and I became a difficult writer to deal with. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that was my, my, my reputation at, at, at Bantam. Uh, so anyway, so then through a, 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 a whole bunch of, um, it would re make an interesting story. And I won't bore you with trying to reconstruct it because I can't remember the details. But they got uh, Rowena Morell. Uh, and that involved telling me, uh, they suggested Rowena Morell, and I said, fine, call her up. And they called her up, well, she's too busy to do it. And I said, you know, and I thought, okay, you know, is that okay? And then I looked her up in the phone book, and I thought, well, let me call her up. I never met her, at least. Appar apparently, she said that she had once met me at, at a convention, uh, at, a, at a convention. I. You know, I don't remember meeting it. You know, when I'm, it, you know, when you meet a whole bunch of people at the same time. But anyway, I called her up and I said, uh, "Hi, Rowena Moel. This is the, uh, someone said that they called you up and you were too busy." And she said, "No one called me up from Bantam. It just, I, it didn't happen. You know, so they would lied to me. You know, which is about par for the course with major publishing companies. And they said, "Look, here's my, here is my number." get someone to call me at this number. So we did. And the result was this wraparound cover, which I actually think, is it my view of the people in the Varian? No. But it's a lot better than the Orientalist nonsense that they had done before. Uh, and so this is one of the, Rowena, bless her soul, um, she also used to have problems. Um, she uh, initially, in the sketch, wanted the dragon to be on the back cover, so that you would look at it and you had the two figures. No, 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 back. Don't, don't, don't leave it yet. Sorry, I thought I had. Uh, so you had the front one. Maybe you can see. Go, maybe you can go back one more. This. Yeah, this this one. This is the front of the cover, and she had the dragon on the back of the cover. Uh, and you turned the book over and you saw the dragon. Ah, that's the, you know, at which point, but Len Wein, at, uh, at Bant, the Bantam art director at the time, uh, said, no, 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 put it all on the front. You know, you know. so she did, and, you know. And it's actually, you know, such things go, it's, it's, it's okay. But, uh, uh, and this is certainly better than the, uh, than, than the Orientalist uh, nonsense that uh, they, they had before. And it, and, so, so there you go. So and, that's that's that's. And you said how Navarian, in some way, was, if anything, trying to overturn Orientalist. Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. Uh -huh. Stories, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Did, does this? What about this cover? Did you like? Well, I just like it. It's, the, it's, it's you know, <laughs> a big, big tree, a dragon. What else do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Only it should the dragon should have been on the back, uh, so that the, you know, it, it, the whole thing would have been much. Uh, I think she had to repaint that huge, you know, thing to 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 make it to make it work. I think your phone might be playing. What? I think it might be playing. So yeah, we have a few images yeah, okay. that Rowena did book cover art that we can look at. Okay. Yeah, she did the. She she only did three of their covers. Uh, and that's the third. That's the. Th she did the first one, um, and then there's then then can you see the, the can third you, one? Then this is the second one she did, this one. which is for Neveriono, the second volume, which is a full length novel, of thirteen chapters, uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that I'm fond, of, um, every once in a while I get in trouble. Uh, this book got me in trouble in Texas. You know, <laughs> uh, what got the, but this, it was Rowena's art had got me in trouble. It was the, it was um, Gorgic's butt uh, that they decided they could not put in, uh, in, in supermarkets in Texas because it was just too much for children. Uh, because at that time, science fiction and fantasy in general, uh, even if it was for adults and my stuff, 
was for adult for for adult readers. Uh, basically, uh, it was assumed that it was a branch of children's literature, and this is you know the, the, and so even this Rowena found herself you know being pulled off the racks <laughs> in in the Texas supermarkets all over the all over the state. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing story because it's happening now. Yeah, Again. I mean, yes, with, because, because of so many things. You know, we, we do live, it's not that we don't live, we, we, we live in a strangely conservative culture. Um, and, uh, you know, so I mean, Facebook still can't have frontal nudity, male frontal nudity, et cetera, et cetera, even if it's, in, even if it's clearly a statue. Or unless their unless their algorithms can tell that it's a statue. <laughs> Has that affected your posting on Facebook? Huh? Has that affected your posting on Facebook? Well, yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not out to make waves. I'm really not. I, right. you know, uh, I would. I just posted recently some pictures of some of some statues by uh, Charles Ray, uh, and uh, he has a Huck and Jim. Uh, things that are to both Huck and Jim uh, naked, uh, and Huck, Huck is picking up something from the ground, and Jim is standing, and the and and he's following the text, which says we spent all our time on the raft, the two of us naked, running around on the raft. Uh, but uh, uh, he did this this this. Um, you you can look it up, look up Charles Ray's work, and you can see Huck and Jim. Uh, and you can see that, and it got it, and it was supposed to be done by the Whitney, uh, and and they uh, and it had it, and it was outdoors in the Whitney, and finally they took the commission away from him because it, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. and because uh, it, it was too, too much, too much. <laughs> you can you can see it online. So. So I think now is a good time to switch to looking at some maps. But okay. before we do it, it, you know, I think it's interesting how each of your books, these covers, they show different kind of topographic spaces. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we can now turn. So do you want to say a little bit about Islandia, and then we'll look at. Okay. This One map. of the points. Uh, the only reason Islandia is here is because um, um, I first heard of Islandia because. Um, Austin Tappan Wright's nephew was a uh, Tappan King was a sh uh, clerk in the science fiction shop run by Baird Cyrils on Eighth Avenue in New York, uh, and his and his his wife her, was a woman named Beth Meacham, and they moved from being clerks uh, in um, in the shop to being. Um, uh, uh, editors at Bantam Books. Uh, so there's one when I wish I could show you the whole thing. It make it would make a, a little bit more sense um, when they did the second cover for Neveriona, Neveriona that uh, the one that I said no, you just can't. You can't use this. You, you've gone back to Glansman again. Um, the person who did the text. For it. There's nothing wrong with the text. The text is done by Tap by by uh, ta uh, Tap and King, Austin Tap and Wright's grandson, uh, and I rather like that that art. That I did. I got one book called Grip. Gri that's a art by a man named Bob Pepper, and I did one book called Drift Glass, which also had art by Bob Pepper on it. Uh, and I rather like it, uh, and uh, you know. But there, were, it's it's odd. There are not there are a whole lot of uh, there were a whole lot of artists who didn't want to do fantasy. So that when there were somebody came along who did want to do it, like Rowena, who basically became you know the one of the, she was for a while she was one of the fa most famous ar artists in the world uh, because uh, they discovered that. Um, some reproductions of her work had wound their way into the palace of Saddam Hussein. 
<laughs> and this was a big deal. Uh, and so, you know, so there I was sharing art with Saddam Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she only died a few years ago, uh, and I'm it, it, sadly uh, she 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 lived into her 70s, uh, but she did she died, and she was about 10 years younger than I, and a very nice, very nice and smart lady. And there are some uh, there are some art books that she's that, that she has, and I'm very and, and they she's very good at, at showing and that she shows some of the, the the Delaney work as well. And it's nice to see. That's where I found out that I, she, that, she, that I had met her once. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I also I love your admiration for book cover art because book cover artists are often the people who are forgotten in yeah. the history mm -hmm. of both yeah. art and literature. Right? Yeah, you can, you know, they they, they they all they all have wiki pages, you know. <laughs> And I'm also very fond of Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I mean, often they don't even get cited in the book, right? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, uh, yeah, there, um, yeah, you would never know. You'd, you'd have to recognize Bob Pepper's art to, uh, to, 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 to tell. Yeah. And so, Islandia. This is a map of Islandia that Chip chose. I think is interesting if you've not heard of the novel from 1942 was the life work of Tappan. He spent a long time creating his fantasy world. And Austin. Just, uh, sorry, Austin, designing the, the maps. And yeah, the, Aust yeah, Austin, uh, yeah, it was published in 42. Uh, yeah, 42, that was the year I was born. Yeah, so that's, yeah. It, uh, and, it, and I think it may have been published in England before then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to say about this map when we compare it to the other maps? Not really. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the one you don't find too. Yeah, yeah. Which right? is to say, it, it's another fantasy. It's another fantasy land, and it. Uh, and what is most interesting, what is most interesting about the maps of this sort to me is how they distort maps that you can recognize, and you you can see that much more uh, in uh, some of the distortion, some of the maps of Hyboria, which perhaps we will look. Look, we, we will look for this, which which interests me. This was the first edition of uh, Conan the Conqueror that I read when I was about eleven or twelve. You know, and you'll notice Co the Conan himself doesn't even look. You know, he doesn't look like Tarzan. <laughs> he looks like a, a, you know a British uh, a Briti uh, a uh, Roman. Roman soldier. You know, which is basically what he was until Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 80s, uh, you know, took over the thing for the two films. Yeah. The genre that Conan the Conqueror, maybe some of you are familiar with Conan uh, and Islandia, well, more so Navarian, are part of is called Swords and Sorcery. No, Islandia is, is a, a uh, what would you call it, a utopia. utopia. Yeah. It's a utopian novel. But the swords and sorcery genre, of and course, it's long. <laughs> it's long. The swords and sorcery genre, of course, has become incredibly popular with Game of Thrones. Or maybe everyone's familiar with that kind of fantasy map yeah. or mm -hmm. yeah. video game maps. Often seem to be the the way people encounter fantasy maps now. Yeah. But so we have a few maps of Hyboria we were going to look at. This is yeah. maybe the least yeah, you remarkable can see, of them. Yeah. Yeah. You can see um, this. You can. If you can see it from a little further away, yeah, you can see it's basically what it is. It's it's Africa, it's it's Africa with a with a with something that could be India over there, the Black Kingdoms, uh, the Stygia, Kush, uh, and, and then others that that he just the, the 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 cities and what have you that Howard made up, uh, and people have just people making the maps have just thrown them in wherever. Uh, but uh, it, it, what it is, it's, 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 it's Africa and Europe with no Mediterranean Sea. You know, and this is the, that over there is the Gulf of Persia. You know, and then this is, you know, and then this is, and this is a pretty good, it's a pretty good likeness. And everything is, you know, so you don't, you can, you can get directly from Africa just by walking over the, just walking over the southern European desert. And, you know, you don't have to sail over anything. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how much fantasy just reinforces this geographic structure, right? The north is usually where the, the white people are from. And it's often, like in Game of Thrones, depicted as a more civilized culture. Yeah. Whereas what you sought to do in Navarian was very much reverse those mm -hmm. expectations, right? Um, yeah, this, this is, is another this is another Hyborian, another Hyborian map. 
Yeah, and this map's actually from the map collection here, and you can go look at it. If you uh, want to see a map of, of, of Hyboria and, uh, and all the... Uh, By far you know, the And again, the, 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 Persian, the Persian Gulf and, uh, and, and India are, are, are pretty clear. So all of this is sort of a lead up to a map that I'm excited to share with people is from the Beinecke archive. It's something Chip recently dug up. Um, was related to the writing of Navarian. This is another cover for Navarian. Yeah, this series. is for the last, this is the last, this is return, that is for Return to Navarian, which should have been the last volume. It couldn't be called Return to Navarian because, because, because Bantam overthrew, said we don't want to publish, we, we published three volumes and uh, the last volume had something about AIDS in it which they were not, you know, were not terribly happy with. And so they um, decided they're not going to, they're not going to, publish. if he's going to write about stuff like that, we don't want him at all. So they threw it all over. Uh, and then, so they wouldn't even look at, they, when I handed in the th fourth volume, uh, which didn't have anything about AIDS in it, uh, they said, uh, uh, no, we're not even going to read it. They said, well, no, don't, it, you know, it had only sold 85,000 copies. I know a lot of people today who would be really happy to have sold, you know, 8,000 copies, much less 85,000 copies, you know. But that's, you know, as far as Bantam was concerned, I am still here. Bantam is not. <laughs> uh, so I will just leave it at that. <laughs> And so this is the map that you want to say a little bit of when when did this get created? Okay, this one this one got this one got done a long time when I first I, when I was in in high in, in college, I just drew a map of a fantasy land, which is probably the which was probably the beginning of um, Navarian, and then I thought. Um, um, then as I've got my own place and what have you, um, I decided to expand this map. And I, we can we, you want to go to the, to the next one? Yes, why? A, a real map with a compass on it. And, uh, and why? A desert and, mount, and, you know, and jungles and mountains and what have you. And so suddenly it was looking more uh, like a map. And I made a much larger version of it. Uh, which became a game for me and my daughter to play when she was about five or six years old. I, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the actual game, but it was made out of oak tag and what have you, and it did have, it did have a real compass in the middle of it. The, the compass in that map was in the middle of the ocean, uh, which I thought worked out rather nicely. I thought. But, uh, and then we, you know, we would try to play this thing. Um, at the same time, uh, a woman named uh, Joanna Russ, uh, who is one of, was both a personal friend and also a very fine writer, uh, who also did a sort of sword and sorcery uh, series. I would call it a sword and sorcery series uh, because she got the term. Uh, she never read Howard himself. I had read Howard. She hadn't. But she had read Fritz Leiber's um, um, uh, Fafford in the Grey Mouser series, which are funny, and she liked the idea of funny things. And so, Alex, her Alex stories were based on the um, on the Fritz Leiber books, and there, there's uh, they, there's there's even some play back and forth. Uh, at one point, um, when she started this, Fritz put a, uh, a a character named Alex in one of his late. Uh, sword and sorcery things. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there you, there, uh, and then Joanna unfortunately died, I died in, 19, in 2011. Uh, and, uh, um, and by that time I had sort of finished my sword and sorcery, I was moving on to other things. Um, I do remember, one of the things I do remember is when I did finally finish the Navarian series, I hadn't the vaguest idea of what to write next. <laughs> and I remember being at a Clarion conference and thinking, I have nothing to write. I, have, you know, I always had something that I was working on and there was about a three month period when I was trying to figure out something else to write. I thought maybe my career is over, um, almost, but I did come up with a few others. <laughs> anyway. 
Anything you want to say about the map? Uh, other, well, the, you the know, barbaric land. The barbaric land, unknown, the unknown. Uh, and it didn't even have the name Neverian. Uh, Neverian itself is the word never and young, stuck up together. And then accent marks are put over it to re make it Neverian instead of never young. Uh, although uh, one, of the, one of the wisdom of uh, of, um, uh, of, of, one of one of the general wisdom of, of things is that uh, readers do not like diacritical marks. <laughs> you know, I don't know. All I have to do is see diacritical marks in the title or something, and I'm, what's that? <laughs> what's that? But that's me. I'm a, and I figure I'd, I'd be more likely to interest people who were interested in, in the diacritical marks than those people who didn't want to deal with them at all. Uh, so, but so unfortunately, this is this is you know this is what this is an attempt to sort of suggest the map that I made for to play with with my daughter, you know, uh, and the Vlet, which I, I think of as Vlet is the name it gets in Return to Navarian. It's called it's called the game of Vlet, which is borrowed from Joanna Russ directly. She has a story called The Game of Let, and I asked her, I can, can I use that? And she said, oh yeah, sure. So I used it. Hmm. Unknown caller. <laughs> Get to hear Chip's ring. Very appropriate. Uh, so this was... This, this is probably, so, I would tell you, yeah. this is probably somebody who wants to sell me insurance for a house I don't own. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't live in a house. Yeah, go on. So yeah, okay. we're, we're about to turn it over to the audience for questions. Chip wanted to have as the last uh, slide the the covers he loves the most. And yeah, and this, I, and is I, the, this is the, the one. They're the covers I made myself, yeah. uh, and two, uh, they are. Um, they're easier, you know. They're 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 more. I think they're more suggestive. What somebody said, uh, reviewing this version, these th these covers say literature far more strongly than they say uh, uh, sword and sorcery. Well, I've every I've always thought everything I wrote was some form of literature, you know. So I am perfectly happy that that's what they say. That's a good note. To mm -hmm. open it up to yeah. the audience. Yeah. And are, do we have any any questions? You can just go ahead and raise your hand, and we have two mics that will bring over. We have one oh, right up front here. Okay. Well, I have several questions, but you started out by saying Rake's progress was very influential for you. Well, say Wait, it. You started out by saying Rake's progress was very influential to you at a young age. Yes. And I'd love to know in what way. Well, uh, I, I, was, I was very much involved with writing music, and, and I wrote mu music, and I, I was, I, for a while, I literally did not know whether, for a while, I didn't know whether I was going to be a writer or whether I was going to be a folk singer. Uh, and I used to do sing folk music in the in the Greenwich Village area, and when I when when we when I when I, I had a uh, a band for a while uh, called Heavenly Breakfast, uh, which had a and uh, uh, during that time basically I was the arranger, uh, and so I did a lot of arrange you know I did a lot of arranging and what have you. I thought I was a pretty good good arranger, <laughs> at least I thought so, uh, and it's only because Con Edison changed its credit um, um, approach to um, a bunch of very small recording studios in New York and put them all out of business in one week uh, because they couldn't they couldn't pay you know they couldn't pay their uh, um, their bills uh, and it changed the sound when that happened it changed the sound of rock and roll immensely uh, I mean, there were there were groups like the Loving Spoonful that did not have a drum. You may, you know, uh, they you they almost make up for it. But once you know, once that happened, that was the that was the end of rock and roll without drums. You know, and uh, it's too bad. Any other questions? Um, I actually finished reading Heavenly Breakfast on the train ride here. Um, it's like devastating what Con Edison did. I'm, I'm really curious, um, 
what happened to, to your roommate, Judy, who you were living with? Um, if Judy? You, if, yeah, um, very into um, Espinoza as well. Oh, yeah. I, the, the, the young woman who was reading Spinoza, I do not know what happened to her. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, uh, Bert Lee, who was Snipper, uh, has turned up again, and has, uh, he, he's alive, uh, and has come and visited me at where my current house. And we, we are now, you know, and he's on, he puts out, um, he, he does, he's done some albums and, is, and, is, and sells his own music now, and has performs every once in a while here in Philadelphia. He was 17 when I was 24. So, you know, so there was a big difference between uh, our, our age. Um, um, Susan Schwears, who was the primary person, she is dead. She died. Um, uh, she, uh, she was a very important person in my life. She was the model for uh, Lanya and Dahlgren. Uh, and um, you know, and that um, so that was that was important, and and we did a lot of work together in Heavenly Breakfast. So I liked her very much, uh, and then as I said, and now and and she came to see me a couple of times when I was in uh, in New York, and she had a son um, who with Richard Rialli, one of the guys in uh, one of the guys in uh, who was our, our um, equipment man. Uh, who was a very strange, you know, very strange guy, uh, and you know, and uh, what that, you know, there, there, there we go. Uh, you you can see pictures of Sue if you go to my uh, website. You can see a picture of Sue, myself, uh, and a picture with Bert sort of cut in on the side. So you see three of the. I I have no pictures of Steve, Steve Greenbaum slash White Waysman, who was the main singer and the main force that held the whole thing together. He eventually ended up living in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, is what the last thing I heard, and then once came to see me in New York, bringing his. his hitchhiked all the way across the country with his daughter uh, and uh, then went off again and I have no idea you know what happened to him you know, after that yeah if you're a fan of heavenly breakfast two volumes of chips journals have been published and there's lots of journals from that time period that yeah yeah there's not actually there's I didn't write much <laughs> during the heavenly breakfast time because most of my energy and they don't and 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 mm. And uh, uh, there might be uh, musical things, you know. There might be uh, there, uh, there are a couple of music note notebooks with little jottings of, uh, for arrangements and things, but they, I don't think that's being included in the uh, in the journal. Anything? Uh, who else do we have for for questions? Someone up front. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Hey, Professor. Um, <laughs> thinking about maps and fiction, you Tell know. Tell me who you are. Uh, I'm Perry. I work as a librarian here. Oh, yeah. OK. All right. Okay. But we, I also studied under you at Temple in like right. 2006. Yes, that, yeah, I knew, uh, I I knew a, you were familiar. An yeah. infant. Um, OK. Thinking about maps and thinking about fiction, you know, in maps you have borders and they change, right? In fiction, you have revision and things can get stronger. Yes. And I guess my, my question is, how do you revise? What do you look for? How, how do you make a piece stronger through, through revision? Take out the extra words. <laughs> say more. <laughs> Pardon me? Say more. Say, say more about that. Yeah. Oh, what say more? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I was, I am dis, I'm very dyslexic. Uh, I, uh, or I am dyslexic. Actually, it's not dyslexia, it's dysgraphia. Uh, we, ne we know, we learn more and more about it. It, it never really interrupted my reading, but it does, make, does interrupt my writing. And I, I cannot write, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't sign a check without having to rewrite my signature three times. I'm, I, 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 that's not an exaggeration, <laughs> uh, or not a, a huge exaggeration. Uh, and I, so, and everything I wrote, uh, I used to write, I, I used to have to retype it at least minimum three times and sections of it as many as 12 times 
That was, I mean, that, that, that was just a matter of course, starting from the very beginning. Um, eventually, uh, one of my favorite um, writers is Theodore Sturgeon, you know. And I once, I, I could not imagine anybody could write that without doing a lot of rewriting. And apparently, I went, I eventually, I met him. I eventually asked, I ed edited, had, was involved in editing some things with him. And he, he swore up and down that he did most of those stories, those 122 stories and seven novels, mm -hmm. uh, he did them first draft. And, I, you know, and I think he's right. I don't, I, you know, he, he said, the result was very, it was interesting. He didn't, he had to think through everything first. And he's the best short story writer science fiction has produced by far. Uh, and uh, and the novels are not bad too. Things like uh, the the Dreaming Jewels, um, some of your blood, um, more than human are are amazing works. Uh, and uh, so, um, but he sa he sw says you know, you know, I didn't I don't re I don't rewrite. Um, he wrote uh, a book of his, and I gather the story is that he, he had a contract for writing a book called, um, what was it called? Um, I Libertine, which he was part of a jape with uh, Gene Shepard that he was, that he was, that got involved with. And apparently he eventually went to Ballantyne offices and finished the, and came and started writing the last, you know, 10 or so pages of it and, and typed and typed away and finally fell asleep on the, on the typewriter. And so Betty Ballantyne, who was in the other, you know, other room, came in, moved him away from the office, and she finished the last few pages. So uh, I Libertine is by Theodore Sturgeon with a climax by, not the climax, it's, it's after the climax, it's the resolution. But there's about four or five pages at the end by Betty Ballantyne herself, uh, which, is ama which is amazing to me. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you and Sturgeon are on two sides of, you know, opposites when it comes to the writing right. approach of science yeah. fiction. I was very, uh, 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 there's a, a hardcover collection of, stir, of all the complete stories of Theodore Sturgeon that I was very much involved with. Uh, at one point I thought, uh, because um, Sturgeon, uh, because this David Hartwell, the editor David Hartwell, was very much involved in getting the last return to Navarian published under its own proper name. Uh, and uh, uh, or getting it published at all, it was originally published on this this t title, um, the the Bridge of Lost Desire, and that's because it couldn't have Navarian because Bantam had thrown over the Navarian series, it could not have the word Navarian in it. No one would buy it, so. David came up with the, uh, the title, Returned um, uh, the Bridge of Lost Desire. Anybody who had read the series up to now would recognize the, the name as being part of the series. But it was originally supposed to be called Return to Navarre, uh, which was the, you know, the name-giving uh, title for the whole series. You're also one of the only writers I can think of who has a website with corrections for all of your books. Yeah, I'm into, I'm, I'm, because I'm into corrections, I mean. <laughs> so you should check it out if you're interested in getting the exact copy. Yeah. You, you've done that for most of the books? Uh, yes, I think I've done it for all of the books. Uh, there is, a, in fact, I, I didn't bring another book that I, was, that I, have, I also have um, silly little corrections for, but there's a, I, there's a book called uh, On Dahlgren. I don't know whether any of you have seen that. Uh, that has a, uh, at one point, uh, it, ha it has all, it has a place where it says something about a southern student named Stephen Penley. He's not a southern student. I don't, I, I don't know who he is, but I know he was a University of Wisconsin student, which I only found out after I published the book because um, the, it would, uh, uh, this review, the first, one of the first reviews uh, appeared in this student newspaper, a very good review in this student newspaper. And um, it turned out that my 
friend who is now di who just died a few years ago, Peter Straub, saw this and said, "Oh yeah, uh, I used to work on the, on the on the Daily Cardinal at the University of Wisconsin, and that was the student newspaper that I worked on. Uh, it was not he worked on it about five or six years after um, that review came out." Uh, I have outlived uh, not only <laughs> I have not not only Rowena but also uh, um, uh, uh, um, what is his name? What did I just say? Uh, um, oh, never mind. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so one thing I've noticed about your work, science fiction work, and science fiction in general is like through the way in which you world, world build, um, you're able to, I guess, talk explicitly about what would be considered sexually taboo content. And I'm wondering when you were writing your novels like Dahlgren, for example, or Babel 17, if you actively thought about the impact it would make. Um, like I guess overall, um, or if it was something that you just wrote what you felt, or if you were purposely trying to make an impact. I was never taught purposely trying, never purposely trying to make an Im impact. Um, one thing that happened to me, uh, I do remember after Babel 17 was written, and I went, that was the year I went to my first science fiction con convention which was the Tricon in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, the world science fiction. And I went there, and I was, I was there. I got there. I was wearing flip-flops, and I don't know what else. Not much. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm, standing at the, I'm standing at the edge of the, uh, um, the, or, the auditorium where people are milling around. And this young man comes over. I had a badge on of some sort. And this young man, who could not have been more than 14 or 15, probably young, unless he was just very young, came, came wandering over to me and he said, hi, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're Mr. Delaney. And I said, yes. And he said, um, I, I, I just read your book, Babel 17, and, and that's the one where, 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 the, where the three of them all do it together. <laughs> you know, and, and what have you. And I said, yes. And he said, is that really possible? And I said, well, I had just come from a relationship exactly like that, and I, which had been based on. And I said, yes, it is. And he looked at me, and he took a big breath and let it out. <sighs> a huge sigh of relief, and turned around and walked away. And I thought, I've got to be doing something right. <laughs> You know, somebody is very much happier now than I said that this is possible. And so I thought, well, so I just, I've never given it much thought since. I just do what I want to do and, um, and hope for the, you know, and, 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 if pe and it's invariably, it's interesting that the, right now my two most popular books are um, a book called The Madman. Uh, which is full of stuff like that all the way. And another one uh, called, and, and, and my book on Times Square uh, Red, uh, on Times Square, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Uh, and those are, you know, th those are very, those are the ones, and the only people that anybody ever asks me questions about. Yeah, so I guess somebody is, res somebody's res still resp responding to them. Any, uh, anything else? Yes. I was just wondering if there were any um, like modern, like within the last 10 years or so, um, sci-fi or fantasy. I don't read much science fiction. Sure, sure. <laughs> I have never read that much science fiction is the truth. I mean, I've, I've always been a main, mainly a literary re reader. Uh, I never, you know, I, uh, I wrote, I wrote, I, uh, did I mention that I wrote t uh, 10 novels 
before I, you know, before I even, you know, yeah. I yeah. You mean when you were young? Yeah, when I was younger, I mean, you know. And I just, the, the, because Marilyn had had this briefly for about five months, had a job at Ace Books, um, that's the first one that got published, and then a, a few others. Uh, but I, you know, the, um, the, 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 I, never, I never thought of myself as basically a science fiction writer. Uh, 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 you know, uh, that just happened. Or a fantasy writer. In fact, Bantam, when I was writing, Bantam, when I was originally writing this, was very unhappy with the whole thing. They had just <laughs> given me a $50,000 contract for three science fiction books. And I kept on turning in fantasy novels. And they kept on saying, no, 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 no. We're not, we need science fiction, you know which I think is really stupid. But uh, as I said, I'm here, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> I think this goes back to the question about world building, that you, you, yeah. you, have a you are able to adopt the styles of many different genres. You know, from erotica to science fiction and yeah. fantasy, yeah, and and things like you know, and uh, you know, and and um, a, a book like um, Dark Dark Reflections has got a the Stonewall Book Award. You know, I'm very proud of that's one of the awards I'm most proud of, uh, and it's a it's not a, it's not science fiction in by any shape or you know, uh, and that's you know by any shape at all. Would you say there's any contemporary writers generally that you're? Oh, as I said, I a lot about? The, well. Uh, it's hard to, to know, and the reason is is because I had was I went for about three years where I was simply sleep deprived, uh, and I couldn't read at all, and then it's only because I have discovered this marvelous over-the-counter thing called Zequil. <laughs> that I now get four or five hours sleep a night, and the result is that I uh, I can uh, uh, I can I can. Go, I can read again, so I'm just starting to read, and and I can read, and I can also, thanks to Bill over there, I can also answer my emails. <laughs> you can still recite Greek, huh? You can still recite Greek. A little bit of Greek. In Arche and Hologos, Kai Hologos, and Proston Theon, etc., etc., which is the opening, I think, of the Odyssey. Uh, and uh, I think you have a catalyst poem translation coming. A catalyst poem. Catalyst. 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 Excuse me. Yeah, catalyst five. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a catalyst five is the most frequently translated of the catalyst poems, and I had a, uh, uh, I did a when I was eighteen years old, I did a translation of catalyst five. We wamus meales biaque memus rumoresque senum suere or omnis unias aiste memus aisis. No bees cum semel acadet per weeks looks nox es perpetu una dormienda da mi basia mille dende cantum, etc., etc., for another four lines. Uh, and somebody is now putting a, a new directions, is putting an anthology out of various and sundry people's translations of Catullus V. And so they are using my 18-year-old translation of Catullus V, live, love, lesbia, you and I together, staunch, staid, stolid thoughts, you and I must never take tight to our hearts, but recall in sorrow, one sun sets today, one will rise tomorrow. Our life, our light, once it sets, must, is, must be out forever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't even remember it now. But it will be, uh, along with a lot of other people's interesting, you know, that include people like, you know, Philip Sidney uh, and, uh, uh, and everybody who tried to, everybody who tried translating it at one point or another. That's amazing. Sure, I'll, 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 how are we doing time-wise? A little over, but we can, yeah. If there's another one, I will, I will try to answer it. Since, we're t uh, since this is in relationship to an exhibit about world building, um, when you are building your worlds, do you visually see them as you're building them? Do you, um, what, what is your approach? Do you make maps? Do you, what, do you take, make sketches of relationships? I don't, draw I don't draw pictures and I don't make maps. I do outline. I am an inveterate outliner. Uh, and I noticed, in, in, as I said, the main thing about doing this series is in the course of the series, my vision of the whole country changed. Mm. Uh, when I wrote Tales of Navarian, uh, 
it was a relatively, you know, there were some mountains and then there was a city at the, you know, at the other end of a road. You know, now then there's, by the time I got to the, um, you know, um, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, and that's that that I can say that that changed. I do visualize. I I have to see it. Uh, and I um, Sturgeon again said the best way to write. And I thought I I certainly followed this thing, of this 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 advice. He said what you do is before you write, you visualize everything you can about the scene. Everything, everything you can about it. Then you do not describe it. He said, but you move the character through the scene in whatever emotional state he is, he or she is in. And you mention only the things that impinge on his or her consciousness. You do that and the reader will see a scene not the same as yours, but as vivid and as clear as you saw, which is great advice. It's just absolutely great advice, and I would, I would say, you know, that's a good thing to, and that's directly from, directly from Theodore Sturgeon's mouth, and he's certainly a much better short story writer than I ever was. <laughs> Okay. You have one more question. One last person, it's Mark. <laughs> yeah. All right, this will be the last question. Hi, Chip. It's Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> uh, it's an easy question. What's, what are you doing next? If I'm lucky, a Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> is Which is the short answer <laughs> to that. Okay. All right. Well, I think we are. Is it okay if we wrap this up? Yes, here? by all means. Thank you all very, right. very much. Everyone, can you give a round for Samuel R. Delaney? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm so thankful for both of you to be here. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Alex, who made the connection. Please sure. thank Alex for moderating tonight. <laughs> Appreciate it. Is Alex, actually, can you, did you introduce yourself and say where you worked at before? Yeah, I did. I work at Temple Libraries. Yes, exactly. If anyone wants to come visit me at Temple Libraries. I'd yeah, he is to wonderful. I have yet to really come visit you. I have to come hang out and watch the crane over at Temple. Yes, all right. So thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. We really appreciate it, and we hope that you enjoyed yourself. We do have some books over here. We actually have this entire collection of Neveron over here for checkout and a couple Navarian. of Navarian. Navarian. I'm so sorry. I actually <laughs> asked Alex earlier how to pronounce it and I messed it up. Navarian. Navarian. Thank you very much. There's an accent <laughs> over it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Right? So we have the whole collection of the Vary and a few other books. If you want to check something out, feel free to linger. But again, thank you so much. Keep reading. If you don't have a library card, get a library card. Come hang out with us at the free library, all right? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.